Hello, this is the second video on the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. In the previous video, we introduced the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 1, where we look at how to actually find an integral without having to find the approximation, without having to use the definition of a definite integral, how to find the value of the area exactly and quickly. It's the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 1, and we did two examples. This video will be right about three or four more examples. My name is Nikai Rimmer. Thank you for watching. Let's get started. So we have the example three here, which is one involving trig. Our first two examples were pretty straightforward. They were polynomial in nature. Now we're going to get to some more difficult examples. We're trying to find the area underneath the graph of sine of x from zero to pi. You know, when, when x is zero, sine is zero. And when x is pi, sine is pi. This is the first arch of the curve y equals the sine of x. What's the antiderivative? According to the fundamental theorem of calculus part one, we just need to find that antiderivative and evaluate it at the limits of integration. What function has sine of x as its derivative? You would think it'd be cosine of x, but there'd be a negative out front that would come from the derivative of cosine being negative sine. So to balance that negative, we get a negative. And so the antiderivative is the negative cosine of x. Check it out. Take its derivative. You'll see its derivative is negative 1 times a negative sine of x. Those two negatives cancel out nicely to give us the positive sine of x. That's our f of x. What are you supposed to do with this? According to the fundamental theorem of calculus part 1, you are supposed to plug in pi, get the value, plug in 0, get the value, and subtract. What is negative 1 times the cosine of pi? Well, the cosine of pi is already negative 1. Negative 1 times that will be a positive 1. What is the cosine of 0 times a negative 1? Well, the cosine of 0 is a 1, so it will be a negative 1. They don't cancel out, though, because you're supposed to subtract. So 1 minus a negative 1, the area underneath the first arch going from positive angle values um, between 0 and pi, the area there is exactly 2. All right. OK. Let's use some other interesting functions. How about this particular function here? It's not a polynomial, but it starts off looking like 1. Yeah, it is, like 1 half of x to the 7th. But then we have 1 over x to the 5th. So that we can do by Using the same, you know, power rule in reverse that we did in the previous examples, but um, we need to write it with a negative exponent. If there's a constant up top, please bring that exponent up as a negative. So we have one half of x to the seventh. And oh, wait, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize this at first. The bounds of integration are root two for the lower bound and one for the upper bound. There's something strange about that. You see, what we're supposed to have is the lower bound being a smaller number than the upper bound. This is backwards, right? Root 2 is more than 1. And so you have to recognize it at the beginning and then make it proper. The proper way is to have them flipped. The consequence of flipping them, though, is putting a negative outside. Okay, now let's go up and bring the x to the 5 um, up as a negative x to the um, 5. Sorry, x to the negative 5. And then we just do the power rule in reverse. We add 1, divide by the same thing. For the first term, we have x to the 8th. We divide by 8. There's already a 2 down there, so it's x to the 8th over 16. x to the negative 5. If we add 1 to negative 5, we get a negative 4. So x to the negative 4 divided by negative 4. But there is this subtraction sign in between. To make it easier for us, you see, we need the negative exponent to take the antiderivative, just like when we use negative exponents to take the derivative. But when it's time to do some algebra or plug in and evaluate, it's better to have a positive exponent. So we're going to put that guy back on the denominator with the with a x to the 4, um, do these double negatives as a plus, and so we're going to use this version as the, um, something that's going to be nicer to deal with algebraically. Our job, plug the square root of 2 in. Plug a 1 in and subtract. Don't forget that negative who's on the outside from switching the bounds to the proper order. All right, let's plug in red too. 
What do you get when you plug a rad to it? Square root of two. You have to take it to the eighth power. And then square root of two, you have to take it to the fourth power. The best way is to deal with it with a fraction exponent. You know, root two is two to the half. So if you're already two to the half and you get raised to the eighth, what do you do with it? You raise something to a power to another power. What do you do with those exponents? You multiply it. So that'll be two to the fourth, which is 16. And then root two to the fourth is two to the half to the fourth. Half of four is two. It's just a four. What we have is 16 over 16, which is one, plus one over four times four, which is one over 16. All together, 17 over 16. Now we plug a one in. So we plug a one in, we just get one eighth and one fourth. We're adding them. I'm sorry, one sixteenth and one fourth. One to the eighth is a one. And then, um, yeah, that's gonna be five sixteenths. Common denominator is a 16, multiply the second fraction up top and bottom by four, one plus the four in the numerator, you get five, five sixteenths. Your job, subtract these. But don't forget about the negative on the outside. 17 minus five would be 12. Got the negative on the outside, and it just it shouldn't it shouldn't sit right in your soul to leave this as your answer. Got to go back and remember to reduce. They share a common factor, which is four. We divide out by four. The answer to this question is negative three quarters. Okay, but if you look at the graph of it, the majority of the area is above the x-axis, and so. It's only negative because we had the bounds backwards to begin with. All right, and that's our second example for this video. I think we have time for one more, one more. Much like the last one, except for um, instead of uh, oh, one over x to the fifth, we have a one over root x. All right, the roots are no good when it's time to find the antiderivative. Okay, this is the actual graph there of the function, and we're talking about between one and four. So our job is to rewrite the integrand so it's nice and easy to find the antiderivative. We're going to use fractional exponents. The first one is x to the half, while the second one is x to the negative one half. Power rule in reverse to find the antiderivative. Add one to the exponent. So we g um, g of x would be equal to uh, x to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves. Uh, negative half plus 1 is half. So x to the half divided by half. We don't really divide by fractions, do we? We multiply by the reciprocal. So we're talking about 2 thirds x to the 3 halves plus 2 x to the 1 half. And if you want to, you could go back and, and uh, use radical exponent. You know, use, use the radical symbol. But what's our job to do with this? Once we get this antiderivative, uh, plug a 4 in and plug a 1 in and subtract. So let's plug the 4 in. What is 4 to the 3 halves? Well, it's 4 to the 1 half. It's a perfect square. So that's square root of 4, which is 2, and then you cube it. So 4 to the 3 halves is 2 cubed. It's an 8. So you got 16 over 3. And then for the second part, that's just the square root of 4 there, so that's 2 times 2. 16 over 3 plus 4. Leave it like that. You don't have to go ahead and put those together. All right? We're going to find that when we plug a 1 in, we're going to also have a, a something over 3. And so we could combine them when it's just time to do our subtraction. Don't think you have to get a nice, simple, um, simplified answer. We don't have to simplify uh, these. We can leave them like this. Okay? Plugging a 1 in, we're just going to get 1. You know, 1 to the 3 half is a 1. 1 to the 1 half is a 1. So this is 2 thirds plus 2. So we take our upper limit evaluation and we subtract our lower limit evaluation. And therefore, we could pair up these thirds with each other. 16 thirds, take away 2 thirds. 14 thirds. 4, take away 2. Is it 2? Common denominator is a 3. We need 6 over 2. 3 and 14 over 3. Final answer is that this area here, represented by the yellow shaded area, is 20 over 3. That'll be our last example. Thank you for watching. My name is Nakai Rimmer. Please like and subscribe. Comment down below. I'm happy to help you. Reach out to me if you need any help. Thank you very much.
See you in the next video.